Good evening and welcome to the Central and Select Board meeting. Today is Tuesday, February 16th, due to the holiday. We're uh, broadcasting on our on Tuesday night. And uh, tonight we've got <clears throat> a bit of a full agenda. We've got a legislative update with um, Rep. Natalie Blay and, uh, and uh, Jared Freeman from Senator Comerford's office. We've got uh, an appointment of all states' weighers. We've got a discussion about amending a design selection process to conform to current state thresholds, a conveyance of 120 North Main, some discussions about potential borrowing authorizations, and then our usual updates. So I know you guys are pressed for time. So without ado, I'll uh, turn it over to Natalie. How are you? Thanks for coming on and giving us an update tonight. Good to be here. You have a busy night ahead of you. Uh, yeah. So it, it's good to be here. Uh, my hometown of Sunderland, it's good to see you all virtually. Hopefully I'll be able to see you all in person sooner rather than later. Um, so I'm gonna give a real quick update and then it would be great to hear from you about what your priorities are and how we can be helpful in the 192nd session. Uh, we had a very busy 191st, my very first session. Uh, it was a busy two years with COVID. I learned how to do things one way in the first year and then had to learn how to do things in a completely different way in the second year, as, as did you. And, and we're all in this together. And I just wanna thank you for all of your efforts during COVID because I know that, that you all have gone above and beyond and just wanna thank the select board of Sunderland uh, for, for your efforts because I know you've been working overtime. Uh, and speed, one of the things that, that you kept me busy with actually in the last session was, was passing a bill, changing the board of selectmen uh, for the town of Sunderland to select. <laughs> that is one of the approximately a dozen local bills that uh, we were able to introduce and move forward together with, with the wonderful assistance of Senator Cumberford on the Senate side. Um, there, in terms of big high level goals that we were able to get across the finish line last session, I wanna point out um, you know, I think we had hoped, well, we had hoped to get an additional $100 million for the Chapter 90 program. We were not able to do that. Uh, it was funded at the $200 million per level, and I'd love to see that go up. Uh, we were able to secure uh, $100 million for a new municipal pavement partnership program, which is a result of an amendment that I offered. This is something that the governor is supportive of. So we'll be pushing hard to ensure that our rural communities are able to take advantage of, of those funds. Um, right across the river in Deerfield, it was able to secure $500,000 for our bi-local programs, which as you know, our farms out here are tremendously important to our local economy and certainly to our health. We were just here at Riverland Farm last week uh, with, with the secretary to make an award. There were a number of Sunderland um, businesses that were awarded funding through the Food Security Infrastructure Grant Program. And for anybody who's out there that got them in Sunderland, congratulations, I know you worked really hard. Um, there's one thing that I had hoped to get across the finish line in the last session, and we came this close. Uh, there were two big rural priority bills. One was establishing the Office of Rural Policy. One was advancing the Rural Growth Fund. And we got the Rural Growth Fund through the House, through the Senate. It was through conference committee uh, and complete surprise. It was one of seven things that Governor Baker vetoed. Uh, Senator Adam Hines and I have sent a letter to the governor requesting a meeting to ensure that he understands uh, this program and its value to our rural communities. And we will continue to push for that in this upcoming session. On Friday, we received our committee assignments. I'm thrilled and, and honored to be able to serve as the vice chair for children, families, and people with disabilities, the joint committee. Uh, it is being chaired by Mike Finn out of the Springfield area, so I'm looking forward to working with him. I've also been named to the Ways and Means Committee, which is something I'm really excited uh, about. I don't know if you know this about Jared Friedman. He used to work for Steve Kulik, uh, who served that committee as well. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I'll also be on the Transportation Committee and Tourism, Arts and Culture. Uh, you all know that tours, uh, transportation is something I'm passionate about. We've talked about RTAs. I'll be filing a bill to strengthen our RTAs. 
also filing bills around agriculture and around the environment. So with that quick tidbit, I'm gonna turn it over to Jared and just say what an honor and a pleasure it is to work with Senator Comerford. There's not a more passionate Senator uh, working in the Senate and we're really lucky to have her and we're certainly lucky to have Jared working on our behalf. Thank you, um, Representative Blay. That was a very um, kind uh, introduction and um, I'll try not to duplicate um, the issues that Rep Blay has talked about, but I would just say that um, it was a pleasure working with, with Rep Blay in this first session. I thought you know the representative had an incredibly effective session and, and thrilled um, that you know you've landed a vice chair position of a great committee and we'll be back at transportation. Um, rail is something that we've really partnered with Rep Blay's office and other regional legislators on both the prospect of Route 2 rail across the northern tier um, and we, you know, with, with, with Pan Am, a big rail operator in the region up for sale, a new Valley Flyer pilot uh, you know, coming through Greenfield, Northampton and down to Connecticut and through New York, it's a good, good opportunity for, for rail. I think Rep Blay talked a lot about transportation work. Um, so, you know, on Senator Comerford's behalf, and, and I'm sorry that she couldn't be here herself tonight, um, I, I guess I'll speak briefly about some of the things that we grappled with last session that Rep Blay didn't uh, touch on. Um, you know, education was something where we worked with Rep Blay, a lot of other regional legislators. The legislature did pass the Watershed Student Opportunity Act, and then since then, the work hasn't stopped. It's been important to really watchdog the funding for that, make sure it appears in the budgets. And for regional schools, um, schools with higher than normal uh, special education populations, um, schools in rural areas or with low and declining enrollments, you know, the Student Opportunity Act did not solve the whole problem. So that's certainly an area that, you know, Senator Comerford has worked in a lot and would continue to work in. You know, Senator Comerford chaired the Public Health Committee last session and during COVID-19, um, you know, we've seen local boards of health and local health systems, you know, really Massachusetts did not have a good, uh, you know, system going into COVID-19 and um, local health officials, you know, have worked really, really hard, but the system just was not set up well to support them. So um, Rep Blay, you know, thanked you all for your work during COVID. And, and that was so appropriate because um, whether it was you know, clerks working to deal with new elections processes, um, whether you're looking at your town meeting and thinking about whether some of the COVID-19 town meeting modifications are gonna still apply in this new year, um, or whether it was, you know, local boards of health and the added responsibilities placed upon them. COVID-19 just placed so much added work on every, uh, you know, municipal official. And so, I would echo Rep Blay's thanks for all of your work during COVID. I would say that we're fielding questions now about town meeting and some of the COVID-19 specific modifications and will the legislature act on those again this year? And then I would just segue and say that the work to support local boards of health um, is something that Senator Comerford is really gonna continue to focus on in the upcoming year. Um, I, I Like Rep Blay said, I, I really would love to hear from you all tonight. And so in closing, um, Senator Comerford is back at the Public Health Committee. Uh, she's chairing that. And she's also been appointed to chair a new committee uh, dealing with COVID-19 oversight um, and emergency preparedness. So I think, you know, with the vaccine rollout, we're excited to get that committee stood up and dig in as quickly as possible. Certainly there have been a lot of issues with the vaccine rollout and um, a desire to have, you know, a lot of questions answered about what's happened so far during COVID with, you know, whether data have been problematic or uh, your community didn't work so well with the contact tracing collaborative, really dig into that with this new committee and uh, make sure that we're prepared for the, the, the next pandemic. So that's with regard to committee assignments um, for this upcoming first session for Senator Comerford. In addition to the work of the committees, you know, um, agriculture is something that Rep Lane noted that we'll continue to collaborate on. I was just on a call with Senator Adam Hines's office earlier today, and I know they're gonna file a good bill on pilot, pilot payments in lieu of taxation for state-owned land. Um, certainly, as it relates to municipal budgets, 
you know, we're thinking about pilot payments, we're thinking about education funding, uh, we're thinking about supporting local health officials. So we've got about uh, 68 bills that are getting filed by Friday's deadline. Um, and Replay has a lot as well. And um, with that, you know, there's much more I could say, but I'd love to hear from you all. And maybe we can discuss more in response. But I would just close by, um, again, stressing what, what, what a great partnership we've had with, with Replay um, and, and, and really looking forward to continuing that work on behalf of Sunderland and, and other communities. So that's all from me. All right, thanks. I appreciate the updates. Uh, we've got a, a great team out there. You guys are doing a great job, so we really appreciate it. <clears throat> um, did uh, did I? Uh, I'll turn it over to to my two colleagues if they want to uh, bring up anything. Hey, Tom. First, <laughs> I'm I'm taking exception with our elected state officials on how the vaccines are being rolled out to our rural communities. For the last 12 years, 14 years, we have been practicing EDS sites and we've been distributing flu uh, shots in case a pandemic ever rolls around. Representative Blay, Is that a question? Jared, <laughs> no, I, I, I'm trying to help how, how I'm going to get Jared's name in there. Yeah. Is we are ready to distribute vaccines. We have no senior transportation in Sunderland for our residents to get to Greenfield public transportation. We know that that's an issue. Okay. We have no transportation for them to get to Springfield to get the vaccination. I don't know if you guys have talked to our seniors and our residents, but if they have a choice to go to Greenfield or to Deerfield for the shot, guess where they wanna go? So what, do our, what does our government do? What does our state government do for vaccination rollouts? Mm -hmm. Everything that we've worked on for the last 12 years is thrown out and we hire a for-profit company to distribute our vaccines. I volunteered a couple of weeks ago in Pitchfield at the Berkshire Community College vaccination site. They roll through and it's all volunteers. They're, they're, the, the mass uh, um, medical corps are out there. They roll through 800 people a day very effectively, and, and no one's getting paid extra to do that. Why can't we get vaccines to distribute to our people that we're all set to do? That's a Tom, question. That's <laughs> <laughs> so Tom, I, I appreciate your passion and I can feel your heart pounding right now because, uh, and, and, I will and I will tell you that our hearts have been pounding and our blood has been boiling just as much as yours is right now. And let me tell you that this delegation has been fighting hard together collaboratively as, and as a Pioneer Valley delegation to say that the vaccine rollout in this region was unacceptable. And the fact of the matter is that there is no recognition of the role that our local boards of health have played, do play, and will continue to play in our rural communities. It has been such a struggle with this administration to make, to help them to understand that. Thankfully, as a result of, of our efforts, there's been some recognition. We've been able to move the needle, um, but it's taken everything that we have. It's phone calls, it's text messages, it's social media, it's letters. I can't tell you how many letters this delegation has written to the governor and this administration to make the case for our rural communities. It's been extremely frustrating. We share your frustration. I think in the next coming weeks, we're gonna see some more local response. Um, and Jared, I know that you and Joe have been working really hard on this and I wanna give you an opportunity to respond and certainly thank Senator Comerford for her efforts. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't duplicate anything Replay said. I, it's, it's, I agree with it completely. And I would just add that, um, you know, this vaccine rollout should have gone much differently as Replay noted, you know, utilizing the expertise of, of local officials 
where they had that capacity and you know building up more local public health capacity um, beforehand. I just, the only other point I wanted to add, Tom, was your point about the lack of rural public transportation. This is something that Replay has really worked on and understands you know, very well from her time with Congressman Olver and other places. With Senator Comerford, we were able to secure a very s small sum, we thought, for uh, FERCOG. And FERCOG was able to set up um, a rideshare pilot program, which uh, takes seniors or other social service recipients, and you can get them on demand rides, get them to their doctor's appointment. So I would, the only thing I want to add, Tom, is that your point is well taken that not only was local expertise not leveraged um, in terms of this vaccine rollout, but there wasn't an appreciation that rural communities don't have the publicly available transportation to get residents to the, the mall in Springfield, to Gillette Stadium, where if you bring someone you can get a vaccine to, it doesn't matter if you can't get there. And so that's work that won't end um, with, with this vaccine rollout, the work of building up public transportation systems, and, and that's work we're, we're committed to. And I would, I would argue, it, it, the administration is hearing from us all of the time. And I am happy to bring the concerns I'm hearing from communities to the administration. I, I don't want to underestimate the power that you have as select boards. And if you were to write a letter, from South County or where, or just do it individually to the administration talking about your frustration, I think it would go a long way. And it would certainly bolster our efforts as, as we fight for this additional, this regional equity. We, yeah, we could, we could do some, that. Some, some, some of our discussions, and, and, th and this is an impassioned plea be because we hear it daily and, 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 and I can't tell you how many times Jeff has taken calls from me or, and, and, and we're trying to put plans together and, and our plans get, get waylaid at us, but we're told, oh, well, you guys, you can, South County can have a hundred vaccinations. <laughs> okay, we can get a hundred vaccination. And, and oh, by the way, you have to put them out on the uh, on the mass.gov signup seat so anybody in the state can come to, to your clinic for you get a hundred shots. And it's like, well, a hundred shots, that's that's two hours worth of work. And and but but Jared, going back to about the transportation, it's not just for COVID. You know, you you talk about the 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 grant that you would receive. I have a I I, I can give you specific examples. Of a resident that we have that who's now in, I believe she's in her 80s, okay, that wants to go to her doctor in Greenfield. But because someone is in a PVTA and not the FRTA, she can go to Maple Street in Springfield to a doctor's appointment for $2. But she can't get a ride to see her doctor in Greenfield that's five minutes away. That's, well, that's just wrong. We, we shouldn't have arbitrary, especially in our rural community, we shouldn't have arbitrary roadblocks because we have to be in a PBTA because we're next to UMass and we have to get money for UMass transportation. It, it, that doesn't make sense to me. And that's part of the legislation that I'm introducing, Tom, because I've heard it from, from the Sunderland Select Board, certainly, that this is a concern. It will look at the connections between PBTA and, and FRTA. It'll look at the connections between all of the RTAs. Because yeah, that has been an ongoing problem. We're right on the edge of the county, so we're kind of in this weird spot. So, <clears throat> so the, the other question we you started talking about pilot money, Jared. You know how pilot and now you know how pilot money first came about. Came, it came about because of the uh, selectmen select board members in, in the Western part of the state got together and say, hey, you know, you know we have all this state land and 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 in and, and some towns, 50% or more, their, 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 their land is all owned by the state. So, so basically it, it came about and, and they fought and, and uh, Tom Rendon, who used to town administrator 
of Irving, then went to Princeton. Uh, he, he was one of the big champion. They got this pilot money and it was kind of shared by the smaller towns out in the Western part of the state and on the Cape. Then all of a sudden, some of the bigger towns say, hey, well, we got courthouses and we got this and we got that. And all of a sudden that, that pot of money, that little pot of money ex expanded a little bit, but then all of a sudden it started getting divided up and given, started being given to a lot of the bigger communities. So the Western, and Western part of the state, our numbers kept falling and they, they fell away. Well, out here in your state budget, there's things called discretionary funds. I can guarantee you that Sunderland doesn't get discretionary funds, but I can guarantee you Boston gets discretionary funds and Cambridge get discretionary funds. And, and you guys, State Senator Comerford, and unfortunately, Rep. Blay, you represent, Natalie, 27 towns, I think, something like that. And, only, and I just, only 19. <laughs> I think oh, Senator Comerford might be up there, though. <laughs> All right. You have 19 towns. Well, they got 19 reps in Boston. So you guys are at a, at a decided disadvantage. So, but we don't get discretionary funds. We don't get, we don't get, we don't get our share of pilot money any longer either. So it, it, there, there's some, there's a huge inequality when, when they start looking at how money is, is brought to the, the small rural communities, in my opinion. So I, I want you to fix that too this year, Natalie. Okay. But believe me when I say it gives me great joy when the reps from Boston with their Boston accents say the word rural. Well, <laughs> well, I remember once yeah, Steve, Steve, Steve had Steve had, I think it was Robert DeLeo came out. It could have even been before that. And yeah, they didn't was before him. But there were all these big yellow things, big right. yellow things that were they Amazing. saw drive around. They were school buses because they don't have school buses in there. They 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 have the MBTA and they they have other ways of getting their their children around without having to pay for school buses. But but if you look at the miles that we have, our students have to travel. And 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 all right, and I'll I'll say it. When you have a regional, we were promised with state that we would get 100% reimbursement for school transportation. The first time that happens will be the first time that that happens. So I, I, I would, I, there's, there's, there's a disconnect. You, you, you gave us a carrot, we ate the carrot, now pay us some money. Boy, I'm on a roll. I got a whole, I got a whole list of things for you guys tonight. I've been waiting you guys for a while. Tom, it was we south need amazing. To more time. <laughs> I know. I know. But I think the vaccination thing is important, though, to, to tack on to what you were saying, Tom, because it looks like we're going to have to be doing annual vaccinations probably for COVID going forward, especially with the variants and everything. So the more we set ourselves up uh, for improving that distribution network and relying on stuff that's here, the better off we'll be. So we can piggyback on that, Mr. Chair, mm. you know, whether it's that distribution or whether it's another emergency response. You know, that, that SEPT plan came out of a DLTA grant, uh, DLT initiative 50, 12 to 15 years ago. The working group met for years. We practiced uh, for mass distribution at multiple locations in Deerfield and in Sunderland. And when it came time to be ready, the team was ready, but it seemed like the resources themselves in total uh, weren't, whether it was logistics resources or you know, invariably the actual shot in the arm. That said, when you look at that DLTA sheet every year and you set your priorities, it's really nice to hear the words partnership until the partners on one side are ready and then we're like left holding the bag, yep. literally. And that's very, very frustrating, whether it's uh, resource recovery, whether it's uh, prevention of natural disaster, all those kinds of DLTA things that we work toward at the local level on an annual or triannual, in this case, a decades long basis, when you're ready to do something, we would expect to implement. That's certainly what our towns, our towns uh, residents expect. It, why, why aren't you doing something? Uh, right now, Larry and Phyllis are listening and I'm sure they're gonna to wanna to talk about communication at some point and how we're communicating. We get all of that. That's in those books that we've worked on for a long, long time. And we're just kind of left with our hands in our pockets going, well, you know, 
We really wish we could help. And it's very, very, um, um, I don't even know if it's frustrating. It's just, what's, what's, what's the value in spending all of that time right. in all of those meetings with all of those people and say, nah, really, we didn't mean it. What should you actually end up focusing on ends up being a question. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a perverse logic, but it's very, very frustrating. So, so Mr. Chair, if I could for a second. Yeah. I, I just want to qualify one of the things I, I, I said before. Natalie and Joe have, have, are the reason why we are having a vaccination clinic in Deerfield starting on Thursday. If it wasn't for how they fought, and, and, I, and, and unfortunately, Natalie and Joe are, the, are the, our closest thing that we get to state government because a governor would buy, they only come out when they give us money um, and that's our money they're giving back to us and we only get a fraction of what we contribute. So that's another story. But if it wasn't for Natalie and Joe, we wouldn't be having the 500 vaccination shots that we have right now that we're gonna, that we're gonna open up our clinic finally on, on Thursday and Friday. Of course, it's gonna snow on Thursday, but. Of course. But <laughs> I, 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 and, and, and Natalie, I did, I did wanna say that. I mean, I, I know I was ranting, but it, it is just such a terrible thing when, I, when we can't take care of our seniors or our people and of all the things that we have fought and, and did over the years to get in a position for this to happen. And then when it's actually come the time to use all that training is just put out to pasture. But I do want to thank you for no, it. If I, it wasn't for you guys, we would have had those, those 500 shots. Thank you. Senator Cumberford has taken the lead on that. And I'm great. I'm so grateful for her efforts. And I just hope you know that you know, we're here fighting alongside you because we're getting the same calls. We're hearing from the same constituents and and we are partners in this with you. And we feel the urgency, we feel your frustration, and um, we are certainly relaying that uh, to the administration every single chance that we get. Thank you. Thanks, appreciate it. Representative, on, on, on timing, um, I yeah. just wanna make sure, I don't know what our timing looks like. We have to be there two minutes ago. And it's yeah. Jared's hometown of Leverett, so we can't. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, the, the concerns about the DLTA experience not being used are all well-founded. I think the majority of the concerns that I've heard tonight are concerns that I'm familiar with and I expect the rep is as well. But for those that were new, I'd hate to miss out on them for a time constraint. So I, my email address, I'm sure you have the reps. Um, but anyways, I think a lot of the concerns were familiar and stuff that we're starting already working on. But if there were any that weren't familiar, I would hate to miss out on. So I encourage that they be emailed. Yeah. yeah one quick one, Mr. Chair, before they skate. Yeah, sure. Uh, with the pressure on unemployment insurance this this past cycle, you know, don't push that down exclusively on employers in the coming cycle. Gotcha. Right. That yeah. can be devastating to a small business. Yeah. That's true. And thank you for your time and all your effort. Yep. Thanks. We appreciate it. It was nice to see you all. Thank nice you, you for right. having to see us you. tonight. All right. Thank Thanks for so coming. All right. Appreciate Take it. Take care. Yeah. All right. Um, why don't we do our minutes next from the last meeting, February 8th. Motion. All right. We have a second. The cat says second. All right. <laughs> All those in favor, Kit Kat included. Aye. <laughs> Aye. Long hand. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, next up, we've got appointment of all states public wares. So we probably get our list of wares there. Jeff. Yeah. We're usually doing this at least once a year. Once indeed. You're on Zoom. I went to my agenda sheet. Oh, you know what? Oh, okay. Okay. One. Yeah. Is it on the screen or no? No. Yes. Uh, what am I looking at? No. Background. I'm looking at something that says a, a leader in quadratic meter meeting solutions. Mm. 
Oh, no, I can see it. All states. Yep, it's for, okay. Um, move to appoint Andrew Pepine, Andrea Casabom. Excuse me, Casabom is public wires. Sorry, I mispronounced that. Pepin. Do we, Pepin, is it? Andrew Pepin. Pepin, yep, okay. It's hard to read on my screen, but I can see it. Can you see it, uh, Tom? Yep. Okay, all right. Put my glasses on. Yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, thank you, Jeff. That helps a lot. <laughs> so there, there are two motions. There's one to appoint people, two people immediately through the end of the year, at the end of the appointment year, and yeah. then to reappoint them motion. all starting April 1st. Okay. All right, so we'll do them in two separate months. Though. So do we have a motion for the appointments of Andrew Pepin and uh, Andrea Kassaboom for up until March 31st, 2021? So moved. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, and then we have, there's a second move to appoint Andrew Pepin, Dean Cloninger, Aaliyah Holmquist-Parker, Jason Macy, Thomas Kelly, and Andrew Ka Andrea Kassaboom as public wares. Beginning on April 1st. Got it. And ending March 31st, 2022. That's, that's the annual. Okay, so moved. Yeah. Right. have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Here are our public wares. <clears throat> and now we have uh, a discussion. I don't know if you have anything to pull up for this one, Jeff, to amend the, excuse me, to amend the design selection process to conform to state thresholds, because we're a little out of compliance with the bump up in state thresholds. This came out of a review of the original policy, Jeff? Uh, yes. Yep, we were looking at it um, as we were preparing to uh, hire a designer for the restrooms in um, Riverside Park. Yep, yep, yep. We were looking at it and realized it was out of date. Um, the, the first four bullets on the screen are straight out of the Mass General Law and basically plops them into the, the select board regulation. So one thing we have at the bottom of many of our uh, policies and procedures are a date adopted, a date amended, a date originated. So if we could apply that history down there. Oh, yep. Great. That, that said, if, if we're just doing this to keep up with a change in the state rules that allow for, it looks like an expanded threshold for designer selection, I'm, I can certainly get behind this. I agree with Mr. Spurgeon. All right. <clears throat> Will those be motions? I'll put that in the form of a motion. Yeah, I was, okay. I was yeah. actually reading the oh, interesting okay. to me that it could go from 1988 to now we are in 2021. Right. And it hasn't changed that much mechanically. It's just dollar thresholds. And then yes. the addition of addition. Right, because you assume if the framework is working okay, you will have to go in periodically and bump that up just because right. of right. cost increases. And yep. that's actually quite a while, 1988 till now. 88. It's a long time when you think about it. Nice. So we're gonna have that motion to adopt on the table with the addition of amended, recommended, I'm sorry, amended and original dates uh, uh, included. Okay. Um, and do we have a second on that? Second. All those in favor of amendment as noted? Aye. Aye. All right, Aye. thanks. Yeah, and that could, that'll be good because then if it comes up again, we can look at it and say, oh, we did this back in 2021. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, no, that is a, that the historical aspect is an excellent little add to it. <clears throat> All right, and then next up we have a discussion about a conveyance of 120 North Main and related documents. No. <laughs> so what does that mean? What does Jeff? that mean? <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Laura. We can't see you, Laura. We can hear you though. How are you? <laughs> Um, so, okay. as we've been, you know, we've been working towards uh, closing on 120 North Main Street with RDI, um, and uh, the schedule for March 1st, and so Town Council has sent over um, 
the quit claim deed and title insurance affidavit. Um, there were a couple other documents um, that there's a historic preservation restriction that the oh. historical commission is going to review and, and vote on in um, sign Monday night. Um, there's uh, also a CPA grant um, for the, the CPA funds that were uh, awarded to this project. Um, and I think that the, the other thing that I wanted to mention was there was a, a, a land development agreement that was considered and spoke to council about that. And um, I think that the understanding is that portions of that agreement well, that agreement isn't necessary because um, the, in the recorded deed, they're going to talk about um, the, the obligations for construction so that it, it would be duplicative. Um, and the town is already protected through the, um, the regulatory agreement. So uh, town council advised that that wasn't necessary to include it would just be another layer um, so that's that's not a document that's included for your signature um, and then the only other issue that I wanted to raise and, and maybe Laura could talk to the likelihood of this but um, council also wanted um, some sort of motion or approval if the closing doesn't happen for some reason by March 1st um, granting a, a license to RDI and their contractors to begin site preparation work, um, yep. even though it, they, they haven't taken ownership yet. That makes sense. Yeah. So Jeff, I think that license agreement actually is effective February 22nd, um, and it would allow the contractor to do uh, kind of mobilization, set up construction fencing, put a trailer on the site, do survey work, um, that kind of stuff without getting into the real nitty gritty of construction. All right, just a little preliminary setup and everything to get you guys staged for it's, the actual it's work. It's the mobilization that it'll take yeah. at least a week or two to get that stuff done. Yeah, all that siltation fencing and all that fun stuff. Yep, you betcha. All right. <clears throat> Anybody have any other questions on, um, on the conveyance? At this point, Mr. Chair, if I could ask, are there any foreseeable uh, things not included in the conveyance? What do you mean, Scott? <laughs> well, there's there's a there's a lot involved in the conveyance. There's I, there's a lot of things that need to be signed. Right. We've gone a long way to get to this point, right? Is there anything that we can think of collectively that may, may have been Come missed back. through all of that? Yep. Yeah. A lot of lawyers looked at it. A lot of people have been talking about it. You get yep. one last chance. Yep. Hmm. I personally don't, but I thought I'd ask the question. Yeah. Well, it's a good question to ask because sometimes things do slip through the cracks. Right. Okay, with that said, right. I'll move the conveyance, to make a motion to uh, sign the conveyance documents uh, as recorded. All right, Second. Second. All those in favor of signing the conveyance document and relevant information for 120 North Main Street? Aye. Aye. Congratulations. Yes. I'll Congratulations, convey everyone. Convey it down to you there. Yep. Thank you. Can you start but, digging the hole? <laughs> <laughs> no. Fence Probably not first now, time. that's right. <laughs> Fence and waddles. Fence so, and waddles. Right. <laughs> um, the, the contractor has been itching to go. We've been holding him back, um, uh, waiting for the conveyance and the other closing documents. But we're looking pretty good for a closing on March 1st. So good. that's really when we're hoping we'll be, we'll be doing all the paperwork, certainly if not March 1st, that following week. Um, and then you'll see a bunch of activity on that site. Um, Great. So feel free to, Jeff knows where to reach me <laughs> when questions arise. Um, we did meet today, okay. just for your information, with the fire chief, the mm. fire inspector, the police, um, chief of police, 
just to kind of, and Louie, the new alternate building inspector and Tom, just to kind of talk about our plan for construction mitigation and the truck traffic. Um, oh, good. And so, it, and it went well, people didn't have any big concerns, but you guys know that there is significant fill coming on the site. So there will be a couple of weeks when there'll be pretty heavy truck traffic and we're trying to get in and out before they start ripping up uh, the road Main in Street. front. Yep, right. That's, that would be, yeah, uh, that'll be good for you. Yeah. That's part of why we're pushing hard on the closing is it just, we, we want to time it so that we miss that with the, we're not competing with them with a lot of trucks. Right. Good point. <clears throat> and we got more snow coming in Friday, I'm hearing, so. Keep your fingers crossed for some good weather, you know. Surveyors are like, oi vey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what metal pins are for. That's right. <laughs> but everybody's really excited. Um, we have a really good team and, and we're really looking forward to, to getting underway. So excellent. There's another, Thank you all. Thanks another so milestone is checked of off. Staying with the project. Yep. Things take a while sometimes, you know. Sure do. Just gotta hang in there. <clears throat> All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. And then next up, we have a discussion about potential borrowing authorizations for capitalization expenses. <clears throat> so I know I saw some a few scenarios that we've got we want to discuss. Jeff? Yeah. Um, I can pull that up. Okay. Um, so and then, the, sorry. No, I was just going to say, like, just to introduce it, like, in a nutshell, we know we've got a, a pretty steady and uh, building amount of capital expenses, and we were discussing maybe if it might be prudent with some debt coming off to maybe discuss um, looking at taking out some borrowing authorizations given the um, historically really low interest rates. So we're looking at, like, 1% or something like that, right? Somewhere in the 1% to 2% range. Yeah, I think it depends on how long you're borrowing for. Um, yeah. As of today, if it's uh, short term, less than 10 years, they said it's under 1%. Um, if we went for a 20 year bond, a permanent bond, it would be um, probably a little bit higher. Yeah. Um, I didn't have exactly what that figure was, so I couldn't run the calculations, but basically, um, you know, did it for five and 10 years uh, for half a million, a million and a million and a half yeah. dollars just to get sort of the range, what the, you know, what it would add to the budget annually. Um, and then what the property tax impact would be. And then scrolling down, you can see, you know, depending on the property value, what your tax bill would increase by. Yep. Um, and I, I'll just note that, you know, there, I use some tools to do this, yeah. uh, but there are, you know, if, if you go for, I, I use the level dirt debt service figure because it was easier to calculate. But if you look at the level principal, you're actually paying less over the course of the term, but it, you know, the the amount per year is different. So you're paying more the first year and then by the yeah. fifth year or the 10th yeah. year, you're paying right. less. And right. I, I didn't, I was, I didn't have time to actually calculate how that would impact each person's tax. So I used the flat number cause it was easier. Okay. And it yeah, still gives you a general idea. idea. Yeah. So could you, if I could, Mr. Chair, Jeff, yep, if you leave, leave that page down there, like two pages down, right? Where you saw, whoop, back up. Right there, where you saw the year one through five, right? Yep. Effectively, that level debt service right there is the value a little less. We we raised about one hundred and eighteen thousand this year on the on the tax that is capital that was passed through the override. So if if we continue to spend as we've seen in the last capital a series of capital budgets, either a series of um, expenses that are coming that include what has been levied currently uh, and some available funds, whether it's from free cash or, or whatever, whatever we come up with. And those funds aren't, aren't nearly as predictable. 
I look at that year one through five for a five year ban based on whatever this particular scenario is. And it seems to me that, you know, a whole bunch of our capital by definition is going to last well past those five years. And it is awfully close to what, whether it's principal or debt service, what we raise already. And if we have the opportunity, in my opinion, to take that value, whether it's the million dollars or the 500,000 or the million five, have, a, have a, a robust plan. And then in that plan, have the funding sitting aside. We know we're gonna spend that money. We have the history showing that we spend that money. Every right. year we spend that money, but we can never get after the bigger projects. We can't get after the roof jobs. We can't get after the, you know, the building assessments that we have from the Roy Brown piece, although we're doing one through CPA. Um, you know, something like this to me um, has value for discussion. If we're simply going to be paying the piece that is the funding of the big, the big nut, right? Whether it's a million and a half dollars over a five or a 10 year period, if you scroll back up, Jeff, a million and a half dollars over a 10 year period is, is pretty close to what we raise in any given year. Right. We have a dedicated funding source. We know we have a backlog in the millions of dollars. Maybe it's worth exploring what this would mean on the tax rate. We know this has a uh, already got one dedicated, the mechanism centered around capital stabilization and what can go into it from a funding source perspective. We know we can apply debt to it. What does that structure look like so that we have a, a 10 year view and we fund the 10 year view? And that's why I was, I was hoping to have this up. And Jeff, thanks so much for the information. I understand this is uh, topical. It's not specific to a particular plan, but this is a framework for what financing a capital plan over a decade would look like. And there's a lot to recommend longer term planning. We tend to um, really drop the ball mm -hmm. to generalize in this country on long term planning lately. Well, even at the town level, we're, mm -hmm. we're pigeonholed to go year to year to year. Right. And we're just trying to like survive and right. And meanwhile, costs that we know we're going to have to incur and things that need, we know need to be repaired are just getting worse while we try to just deal on a year to year basis. While we're talking, he's changing the numbers. That's pretty yeah. good. Yeah, I was, I was <laughs> Live update. <laughs> Live updates. <laughs> anyway, I, I look at, Sorry. I look at these and I would, I would, uh, I would encourage the board to discuss, um, what this looks like with finance committee and capital yep. and uh, bring forward a recommendation over the next you know month or so. Yep, I appreciate the adding that on there, Scott. That's something we definitely need to look at. <clears throat> and it's that time of year, so. Right. And to a certain extent, it, it, you know, it's, it's a bit of responsibility and, and actually looking at what we've got and trying to deal with it rather than just sort of putting it off constantly and kicking the can down the road. I, I look at it, Jeff, I look at it, uh, Mr. Chair, as, you know, we're funding a hundred and say $120,000 a year right on the, on the tax levy. So we do $120,000, you know, snapshot. And the following year, there's another $120,000 snapshot. And we're, we're, we're stuck in the kind of work that can get done $120,000 at a time. Yep. That's not to say that there is a, a million dollar job out there that's gotta get done. But boy, there's a couple of hundred thousand dollar jobs lined right up that we just can't fund them. Right. Cool. All right, just went dark on top of Sugarloaf here. <sighs> Lights go out, your back to your screen doesn't. I know it is, yeah, because that'll stay up. Yep. And then I just sort of fade into the darkness. So. <laughs> <laughs> well put. All right. That's a, that's a good discussion. I look forward to talking with the finance committee about that too and seeing what their thoughts are. Tom, you have any thoughts? I, I think we have to understand we have a, a lot of there. We cap, we capital is always underfunded. So you have to, if, if you're going to continue to pay um, educate for education, there has to be a way to pay for our other things that, that we utilize also. 
and don't don't miss misunderstand what I'm saying. Ed, education um, includes the cost of operating an elementary school and a, a secondary education, the high school, junior high school, also. So there there's cost there's costs associated with that, yep. and we have to find a way to fund that, Scott, long term. Right. Um, so well, and, and 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 we're going to need police cruisers. We're going to need fire trucks. We're going to need uh, payloaders, we're going to need lawnmowers or pavers or whatever. So we get We do got to, we have to, we have to repoint the bricks on the buildings. We have to put in stairs. We have to put in steps. We have to replace lights. So yep. there's Things a cost to get done. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Yep. We'll be, we'll be coming back to that one. I'm sure. So, <clears throat> all right. So now that brings us down to our COVID-19 state of emergency select board and town administrator update section. So uh, I think we have some slightly better numbers as of last night, right, Jeff? Or Sunday night, I think. Yeah, hey, Lori. I like that slow fade in there. She came in dark and then just slowly faded in. That was nice. Yeah, uh, perfected <laughs> that. Hey, nice. <laughs> How's it going, Lori? Good, good. Yes, we do have some much better numbers. Um, I was good. reading, Caitlin sent an email out, you know, updating everybody and our current open case count is 13. Good. 10 of those are UMass students. Of the three remaining, um, they haven't been able to follow up with one of them on community tracing and the other two are in, still being investigated to see if there's any close contacts for them. Okay. Um, and we have not had any new cases at North 116 Flats nice. for quite a while. <clears throat> and their current case load is down to six still in isolation. So oh, that's good. much better numbers. Nice. <clears throat> um, uh, any, anything else um, you want to follow up on with that or? Not with that, you know, okay. um, I'm glad very glad we're going to have the vaccine clinic over at um, Treehouse Brewing. That's that's great. Yeah. Um, but I do want to just remind people to still be vigilant. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Social distance. Wear your face mask. Yep. You know, it's, it's we still have to do those things, even with the vaccine. Right. We're in this sort of tricky spot where we've got to be we can't let our guard down, but we also have to ramp up the vaccines. And yep, it's, yes. a, it's a really important thing to get as many people vaccinated, but also for the rest of us who still aren't, yep. you know, to keep uh, keep vigilant. And, you know, hopeful. I'm hopeful that we'll actually learn something from this experience. And as bad as this has been, there's a potential that it could always be much worse. And if we're not learning from this, then shame on us because that's just really bad. <clears throat> yes. Um, and that sort of leads me into Tom. Do you want to like um, talk about the um, the upcoming vaccinations and everything that you guys have been working on, Tom? Um. There's there's uh. As Lori just said, there's going to be a local vaccination clinic on Thursday and Friday. Um, if we do have inclement, inclement weather, um, pay attention because one one day could be shifted to uh, Saturday. Um, but we'll have to play that by ear. It's going to be at the uh, Channing Beat facility that is now... Uh, City Tree Brewing um, over in Deerfield on Route 5 and 10. Um, also, um, Big Y, I believe it's Big Y, is just got some vaccines up in Greenfield as well. And, and they're, going, they're holding a vaccination clinic there as well. And the uh, Greenfield Senior Center is doing vaccinations there as well. So, I mean, there, there's a few things happening. Um, the vaccines are very slowly coming out. And, and, and I did want to, again, repeat that Senator Comerford, Joe Comerford, and Natalie have fought like the Dickens to get us our 
um, the, the few vaccines that we've been able to get, it's true. It's truly through their efforts, which is okay. so, which I, I, it's just unconscionable to me how our governor and his people could totally forget about um, Western Massachusetts, specifically Hampshire County and Franklin County. I, I don't, I don't understand it at all, but that's another story. Yeah. All right. Any other um, any COVID related updates from your end, Jeff? Uh, yeah, just one thing to add, which is uh, last week, the Board of Health Chair and I met with uh, representatives of UMass um, just to see if there was anything that we could help be supportive of or um, share some ideas to help the students who weren't necessarily in quarantine and isolation, but were um, told to stay in their rooms uh, and talked about things like, could there be a meal delivery service? Would they want mobile testing? And so they were going to look into that. It seems like the numbers at UMass have gone down rather dramatically over the last couple of days. Well, last through what's available so. to be reported. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> the data publicly facing on their dashboard. Right. Um, so that, that's a good sign. Hopefully the Board of Health will be able to put us back in line with the state guidelines as far as closing times and, and capacity limits. Um, so, you know, we're, we're still looking to see where those numbers come out today, but we did have those conversations and I think we were gonna try to help them set up a, a meeting. Um, my understanding from the Board of Health Chair is that when she spoke to the management at North 116 Flats, they were very accommodating. They, um, you know, opened to conversations to helping out. Um, so we were gonna try to set up a, a meeting to talk through some of the things that UMass, the, some of the resources that UMass could provide and how to get that from the, the UMass administration to the residents. Um, and that facility in particular, because there, there were cases there. Right, there's a lot of, yeah, they've got a lot of students as residents in there. I know they did send an email Sunday night, wasn't it? I think already before, just before we were discussing with them about that too, on their own, so. Yeah, I think they, they oh, oh, right, the North yeah. 116 Flats, yeah. They did yeah. send a notice to their residents. Um, and, and UMass yesterday, I think, is due to, the, yes, the, the outdoor exercise they restrictions on outdoor exercising, yeah. um, but still reminded people to wear face masks and and socially distance while they're doing it. So you can get a run on your lunch break around campus, Tom. There, huh? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. So well, on on the COVID subject, if I could, Mr. Chair, there was an article mm. in the Globe on Sunday about how Massachusetts original $2.7 billion CARES allocation of which, you know, 1.3 billion is still unallocated. Is there mm -hmm. anything that we're counting for in the CARES, you know, in the CARES arena that has not been covered? We don't want to overcount or misallocate. Don't get me wrong. I want to understand: are are we are we good with cares? Because according to the Globe, you know, we asked for two point six billion dollars more. We haven't spent a billion three of the one two point seven we already got. It's a big chunk. It's a real yeah. story. Yep. Yeah. So, and I get it's a moving target too, Jeff. So I'll, I'll soften the beaches for you there a little bit. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say. We've been, I'd say, um, somewhat cautious recently mm -hmm. because when we when we asked for the, the second round, um, there were a number of things that were FEMA ineligible, yeah. um, but the state had no way of telling them that, so they only reimbursed us at 25%. Mm -hmm. um, and so we did not get the the there's still money that Sunderland could have gotten. There was a reconciliation period um, back when we thought this was all gonna end at the end of 2020. Um, and they're talking about another reconciliation period, but yeah, FEMA just put out guidance saying, 
everything that was eligible is now eligible that was eligible at 75% reimbursement is now eligible at 100. I think there are also some other categories that weren't originally eligible that are, and I've reached out to, we have a, my understanding is it's a consultant who was hired by MEMA to help us understand um, how to do this. And I've asked and they said, we're still waiting for guidance. So we can't tell you. So, so the, and the situation that I'm trying to avoid is spending all of our CARES money and expecting yep. FEMA reimbursement and then not, and not getting, getting it. it. And right. then yep. us being in the hole and balancing that with, well, we didn't spend the money. Now the state's going to claw it back. Right. Um, so yes, there's another reporting deadline, March 5th. So mm -hmm. hopefully by then I will be able to give you a better answer on where we stand. Well, I raised the point to illustrate a little bit of the confusion in the program and its rollout, but also the fact that the state is asking the feds for basically a whole nother charge of, of similar value. And I'm curious as to know, are we somehow not participating at a level that we should? And I appreciate your diligence and your, your uh, conservative view on saying, well, wait a minute, there's only so much we, we want to ask for because. Oh. Can I ask a question? Can the CARES money be used for like communication and transportation? That's a question we'll follow up with you, Phyllis. Yep. Thank you. And by the way, thank you very much for the improved communication. You know, that's what I was going to tell you guys. Not, I wasn't going to rat on anybody. I was just wanted to say thank you um, that that the communications on FCAT and calling have been proved, and good, um, good. you know that's uh, really helpful for a lot of people in the community. But we want to put in a plug for Channel 15 now that it looks better because <laughs> a lot of people gave up on it a yeah. couple of years ago because it was yes. useless and now it's really useful. And a lot of people aren't checking it once a week like we used to in the olden days. So yeah. anyway, that, that was it. And again, thank you very much for listening and um, doing something about the, the communication. But if, if you can get money for CARES for transportation, like, mm -hmm. you know, it, that would be helpful for you guys and communication certainly. You know, for if you wanted to do a mailing or something and they could pay for and you could get the money from, um, you know, CARES, that would be great for now. Yep. And, and I love the way that Dave beams in and beams out. I have to stand up occasionally and, you know, wave my <laughs> arms to, to get the lights back on. It's very and, interesting. It's very interesting. <laughs> well, and, you know, go, go ahead, Tom. You know, Phyllis, the, the, the problem the problem with with a mailing is that it, the information is changing so rapidly is that if we try to send out a and we we talked Jeff, Jeff Jeff I Scott David um, we we've talked and with our with our counterparts in Whiteley Deerfield um, we we've, we've talked about mailing but as soon as and, and we were ready to send out a postcard not too long ago. But the information, right. but the information changes so fast that before we could write the, before we could write the card, the information was changing. Um, uh, I wasn't it, really talking about the, the, you know, the bulletins and everything. That's impossible. But you could send out like like during you sent out the um, census. Um, if you had a flyer in there that had said something about Channel Fifteen. Um, the Sunderland website, all of the communications that you can use, it might point people oh, to the point. places they can go to because a lot of people don't know, especially in the apartment complexes or new people in town, they may not know what you have available for communication. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, maybe you could send out something to say um, if, if seniors want to be on a email list or a special calling list, and it were, you know, just sort of a once a year um, mailing that would go out to everybody to update how the communications are done. That's all. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and um, 
and 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 the other thing about the uh, the uh, the transportation is tra the transportation has been a bane for a long a long time with us, um, mm -hmm. and and we 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 can't we can't get our people to Greenfield to a doctor's appointment, and I and I, I talked about that and I railed about that already, so I'm not going to go that again, but. Mm -hmm. We, we have, and, and, but it's beyond that. We, we have, I, I have students that live in the apartments that want to go to GCC and they have no transportation to get to GCC. We, we have all, we have all, and, and again, there's just a disconnect and, and I'll start, there I go again, but we, oh, I we absolutely we're, agree. We're, you we're, are we're, totally correct. We, we're, we're told, we, we are told the importance of having, um, um, ten percent of our housing stock as uh, affordable, affordable housing. Sunland has met that goal of affordable housing. Yet, one of the, one of the best ways that a, a person could go, an individual can go, out of that low mod designation is through education. So, wouldn't you think it'd be an amazing way for them, or would be amazingly important? For the have transportation from Sunderland to the local community college, which gives a person a, that first step in a, a, to look at paying for an affordable education, and we can't do that. We we can't do that because we run in because we have an imaginary. There's a river. It's not even imaginary, but there's a river, and it says if you go over that river, you have to put your your four letters on the side of the bus has to change from PBTA to FRTA. And that, that makes no sense to me at all. Well, it's all set up on old county boundaries, which, you know, it's not how people live their lives. You know, so <clears throat> if only we had a unified transportation system through the valley. Hmm? It's also crazy too, Tom, because I, I know all the things that you've done for, for the setting up, like the flu clinics and things like that. Uh, and, and it's, you and then just, it's, there's no way to get people to it. And it's, it's even with this pandemic, it's hard to find a safe way to, you can't just stuff people into a bus and safely right. move them together. Point. I mean, you're endangering people sort of in the, in the act. And because otherwise, I, I mean, you know, there's no shortage of people who would, drive people over to get a shot. Yep. Uh, it's, it's just, it's like the last mile problem in, in, uh, in broadband, in, yep. in broadband it's, it's that last thing that's uh, so challenging and so frustrating. But I, I know you, you guys have done a great job and the volunteers are there and they're knowledgeable. They know how to give shots. They know how to do it safely and they're standing by and they're willing. <clears throat> um, and, 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 you know, Larry, that, that, that's one of the most important thing. And, and I, and I, after, after the, some of the things that happened in, on, at the national, national level, but if you, if you see all of the, all the work that, that's put in by so many people that just care, it's just, a, it's just a very, it's just inside, it makes you feel good. And, and then, and then they get stopped by, by things that, that you know the governor not giving vaccines to to local boards of health. Yeah. Why would you do that? We're we're ready we're ready to to distribute those. Why we we can we can get those and we won't waste them. Why why are we doing it things a certain way and not getting the vaccines out to where they can they can really make an impact? It just sometimes it just doesn't make a sense to me why we do certain. I, I hope kind of like, um, you know, anybody who's familiar with project management too, once you wrap up a project, you have a postmortem, you know, for um, lessons learned and things. And I hope at the state level that gets done after all of this to figure out, you know, <clears throat> and look at ways of improving things. Well, you were saying earlier I mean, that it's very likely we'll be planning on uh, annual COVID shots. Yeah, it's looking uh, that way. For something like that. And that's, Now's the time to. Now's the time to be thinking of that. You're right. Right, and and just 
just as a reminder, too, on this topic, uh, hold up a mask. You, you don't see us wearing masks, but even though all of us, most of us are in the same building, usually for these meetings, we're all in separate rooms. So yeah. there's a reason why we're not. But when we're all together, we do wear masks. So just so folks know. <clears throat> I'll go back to what I think Scott's original question was. I just want to yep. say, I think, you know, as far as our supplies of PPE, Lori's been doing a great job making sure our emergency responders have what they need, you know, gloves, masks, et cetera. We've been ordering sanitizers and things like that. So we're certainly staying on top of um, what we need to protect ourselves and keep the building clean. Um, but I think that what, once we have a, a clearer understanding of where exactly we stand with funds and um, in the current amount that we have been given for CARES yeah. and what we understand from FEMA, then I think we can look at some of, you know, we had talked and I think mm -hmm. to Phyllis's point about communication, we have one variable message sign or electronic signboard in town. Could we look at purchasing another one? Um, yep. You know, I, I think that that's, that's a larger purchase. And so we wanted to hold off to make sure that um, the, 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 you know, more mundane purchases were taken care of as well. But that, that was certainly mm -hmm. something that we had anticipated. Um, and then obviously there's a lot of unanticipated school expenses uh, for remote learners, the, the packages that they have to send home to the kids with, you know, their number blocks for adding um, things like that are, are right. also being paid for out of CARES. And well, you know, that kind of, you touched on something that reminded me of something. And, and actually, uh, Phyllis made, you know, your comment about putting a, like a mailer in, you know, periodically that <clears throat> reminds people we could do the same thing with the message board too, mm -hmm. is, you know, to remind people on there, hey, check channel 15, you know, check this and kind of roll that up. And I know Margaret and I had talked about this when she was here a while back too. I know, I think it was what like I used to work in Westboro and um, they, their town hall had put a new sign outside that was essentially kind of like a mobile signboard and that had an LED thing. You know, maybe we need to think about maybe a, a, a sign like that, <clears throat> you know, like a welcome to Sunderland, but then it has, it's essentially, you know, picture a nice looking version of your mobile signboard that has rolling information out there that we could have out there all the time. You know, now granted their town hall was like right on a main street, but you know, maybe that's something we can think about on a more permanent basis, you know? No, the signboards so. are a good idea, you know? Yeah, they help, I think. Buy five more. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, I will say that there there was the uh, comment made at, at a, one of the meetings that they said, well, do you have options to rent sign? You know, we're not just going to approve signboards. They made a specific thing, but um, to your point, David, I mean, the, the elementary school has a sign, and I think below it, right. you can change. You know, it's not electronic, but you can put different words, you know, messages in it, and that might be exactly. Maybe we look at a new, you know, modern version of that. You know, we'd have to think about where to put it, but you know, something to add to the communication thing, and maybe this year might be the year to look at a very limited um, use of social media maybe too, you know, but we can talk about that off to the side because that's really tough for a small town to do. I mean, you know, it's not like we have an entire, you know, communication department at our beck and call. So <laughs> we don't have an IT department even so, but something to think about. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Lori. Appreciate it. Till next time. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, I'm, I like the trend. Numbers are going down. Things are slowly getting better, you know. And I think yeah. the last I saw, we're looking at still probably April before all of like us are vaccinated. So it may that, speed up, but that may speed up. Yeah, that's yeah. what I've heard. Uh, keep my fingers crossed. But, you Definitely. know, I mean, at least now we're getting some action from the very top yeah. down. So, yep. yeah. All right. Thanks. Yep. Thanks. All right, Bye. and now we reach the select board and town administrator updates of our evening. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll start with Scott since you're a looper on that way tonight, so. I'm actually good tonight. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. All right, how about you, Tom? That's it, Mr. Chair, thank you. 
All right. And we had our personnel committee meeting last week and we put out our final recommendation based on our uh, plan. So <clears throat> it was, that's my update for this week. So then I'll turn it over to Jeff because it's been so quiet in town hall. So <laughs> yeah, so the, the, um, the only update I wanted to talk about was uh, a few weeks ago, you had appointed an administrative assistant to the Board of Assessors. Um, and unfortunately, things did not work out with the person that was appointed. Um, so we are restarting the uh, search. Um, and I just wanted to briefly tell you what I was thinking about as an interim plan, which was um, to ask somebody to work about four hours a week, um, returning phone calls, emails, explaining the situation, if there's something urgent, bringing it um, to someone's attention so that it can be dealt with, making sure that things like um, like the veterans um, tax credit uh, thing or abatements are, are processed. Um, I think I don't think they're due until the end of March, but you know, just making sure that the, the work continues and that people um, get a response. And so we were going to try and bring somebody in about um, four hours a week just to uh, cover that desk, okay. basically, um, for that time and make sure that people aren't emailing and getting no response or just an automatic response. And same with the voicemail. Sure, we could just say, hey, we're working on it. We'll get back to you. But we thought it would be... Um, better customer service. Yeah. Have somebody and, do that. and we'd fund that out of essentially the line item for the salary for the person who's not there doing, you know, at the exactly. moment. So, yep. Okay. So not, not to be that guy, if I could, Mr. Chair, but <laughs> why, why aren't the assessors splitting up the responsibilities and doing it themselves? When, when we were without a town administrator or a treasurer collector, the board members picked up slack <laughs> yeah. in given areas. Well, that's a good question. Um, and I did speak with the Board of Assessors and, and they certainly wanted to help out, but I think that um, coming into the office and getting the emails and checking the phone messages, I, I could see if they're available. Um, I'm just, I, I'm not suggesting the assessors do one thing or another, but I can say what this board did on more than one occasion. Oh. Yeah, I, I, I will. Um, I'll raise that. I think that I think that we had thought that um, it would be it, it would maintain continuity of having somebody else to do sure. those things and set up the agenda. But um, sure. I'll, I'll see that what their availability is to do something like that. And maybe it's not four hours a week. Then maybe you know we get somebody in twice a week, and then the assessors take it, something like that. But sure. yeah, some hybrid thereof. Yep. All right. Uh, and with that, we reach the public comment section of the evening. I don't know if anybody has any public comments other than what we talked about earlier. Yeah, David, I'd like to say a couple of things. I kind of thought you would, Peter. How are you? Good. I'm doing fine. All right. Um, first was you had a brief discussion about the need for um, additional funding for capital projects. and. I, I agree wholeheartedly because there's, you know, we've had discussions on the capital planning committee about this and, you know, it's perpetually, uh, despite the fact that we, we, you took the, the town took that great action, which I'm assuming you guys were the reason for it back in 2013 to, to do the annual capital levy. Yep. Um, there's still most, you know, every capital planning meeting is, okay, what can we put off? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, part of it is, well, <laughs> if you could disqualify a couple of things because they're not really capital and if you can figure out some other reason not to do something, but then you're also just putting stuff off and that's sort of, that just leads down a road you don't want to go down because deferred maintenance just ends up killing you. Right. Um, or deferred <laughs> purchases, same sort of, same thing. Um, so anyway, I look at, the way I look at the situation is uh, number one, we've got 160,000 coming off of the tax levy for the two buildings. Yep. Um, and so, you know, you can't just say, okay, we're going to continue to raise that, uh, 
you know, through the tax levy without having a taxpayer vote for it. Um, right. And so what I look at as far as what you presented tonight was, you know, just three possible scenarios, borrowing, you know, some amount, half a million, a million, a million and a half, uh, paying it back over five or 10 years. My sense is that what we're looking for in the way of a uh, general capital plan for the town is a, a number of items of different size that are needed to be done at different points over the years. Right. It's not like you're buying a fire truck and okay, you got to spend it all right now and then you spend you know five years or something paying it back or you've got to build a new building, the cost is all up front and then you stretch the payments out over however many years you choose. Um, in this case, the 100,000, which is now 118,000, we're getting off the, the, the tax levy for capital purposes, is an amount that comes in each year, okay? And that's really sort of a nice way to have it, um, as opposed to, gee, if we went out and told the town, well, we want to borrow a million dollars, but, you know, are you going to spend it all in year one, even though maybe you don't need the loader for three or four years, you know? So right. why go out and buy it now? So you're going to spend, you're going to borrow a million dollars and, you know, keep three quarters of it in the bank for several years. And and that's sort of, you know, I, I, I don't think that's the best way to do it. So that if I, you know, if I had my, and, and even for that, you got to go to the taxpayers for, to get a debt exclusion for, you know, some amount for some number of years. So, so you're going to the taxpayers anyway. Right. And, you know, I would sort of think that, boy, the ideal way would be to go and just say, you know, the 100, now 118 that we are getting on the capital levy each year has been fantastic. It's just not enough. And so, you know, we've got 160 coming off the tax rate. Could we add something, you know, could we add 100 onto the tax levy? And then that would grow slightly over the years with inflation. And, you know, that would, if we could get taxpayer support for that, um, boy, that would really, you know, because that you talk about long term planning, you know, that's, that just stays there. Okay, right. it's not just there, you know, it's not like 10 years and over five years, and then we got to face it all over again. Right. So, Scott, did you have a question? So, so Peter, along those lines, that that concept is pretty much what I had envisioned, right? When we talked about a debt service, right? If, if we take, take on this debt in bands, we either plug it into the debt schedule, the operating budget, and then every sequential five years, that stabilizes the tax rate, right? You go out for another set of bands over another five-year period, over another five-year period, doesn't exclusively have to be for the capital stabilization from, funded from exclusively capital stabilization, but it can certainly be funded in the debt line of the operating budget. And that's why that 100,000-ish was so attractive, because as you pointed out, there's a bunch of money coming off this year. So if we plug that in this year, that should not affect the rate dramatically. If we drop 46 and you add 41, guess what you got? You still got five cents off. Right. right. And, and the thing is, you know, we, we, have, we have great hesitation to go, to, to go for, for debt exclusions or, uh, you know, capital override or something like that, because you have to get, you know, approval for people just to, to raise taxes. Mm -hmm. And um, so you've got to have a real good reason. Yeah. And... Um, you know, I think we, we, we clearly have the reason because we're trying to take care of the town. And then the thing is, do you want to go back every five years, okay, to ask for another chunk, you know, right. or, you know, possibly every 10 years, but, you know, whatever it is, you know, the, the, the beauty of the, of the capital, over, the capital levy we got now is it's just there. Yep. It doesn't yep. need to be renewed. And, and, and there's no doubt that it's needed. I mean, you look at the stuff that's being used for and you look at the stuff that's being pushed off. Okay. And, and, and it's, you know, you know exactly what it is. It's, it, there's this great transparency. Um, you know exactly what the projects are. You know exactly what we're having to put off. You can see what's coming down the road and what's coming down the road, like Scott says, is some bigger stuff. Now there may be some, there may be some really big stuff coming down the road that even if we, even if we could add a hundred grand to the capital levy, still not going to cover it. I mean, if another fire truck came, came along, that's got to be handled separately. Okay. And I think we knew that it wouldn't cover all of it when we did it, but they, even that little bit was much better than what we had before, which was nothing. Right. 
And right. it, it's, it, it allows for, you know, like we've talked about this numerous times, it allows for stable budget management, you know, and rather than dealing with these neck snapping gyrations of capital costs and things like that. And then, sure. and then it just tends to, you tend to put it off even more when you have to deal with it that way. But, but, think, but I think, think about I, it, go ahead, sorry. I was just gonna say, I think that, you know, you guys do a great job of running this town. Okay, and I think that, you know, there's a good message to be conveyed about why we need to be doing something like this. And we can't, we shouldn't just back off because, you know, we're afraid to ask. Um, again, I mean, the case has to be there. I mean, I think what, you know, it's, it's a different thing than what Frontier did, but it's the same sort of, we're trying to do good planning for the town. Okay, and it's the same way you try and take care of your house because if you don't take care of the stuff, you know, it just, you get burnt real bad in the long run. We just, you know, we just got to get on top of this. So yep. I, I, now I look at the procedure. Okay. And the problem is obviously you've got to have an election um, at the polls to pass anything like this. And if we don't have town meeting until June, you know, I, I imagine actually you guys could schedule a schedule election just on the one issue and have it in July or something. If we wanted to go ahead with this, mm -hmm. um, you know, or not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure of how the, the process might work, but it's. I think it's worth considering what the process might be because sometimes you can have a great idea, but you can get hung up in, you know, yeah. like in the process. <laughs> you know, yeah. How you get there. Sure. You know where you want to go, but how you get there can, you know, our laws can make it quite difficult. Yeah. So I, I you, you say that, Peter, and I was, I was interested and reminded at the same time conversation with our prior treasurer uh, collector about the borrowing authorization for fire truck. And we asked you, how do, how do we want to handle it? You know, what's the best way? What's the best interest of the town? And, you know, how does it work? And Tom was passionate about this as well. So I said, why, why pay all that money in the first five years, right? The truck's going to last 20 years. Why pay it all in the first five years? Because that gives skin in the game to people who are out there after five years, right? They move into right. town, it's on their schedule too, not people who've been here for a long, long time. And I, I appreciate all that, uh, that sentiment. In, in pitching at least the concept of funding capital plan at a million, a million five when our interest rates are, are you know, sub one, it makes perfect sense. The question is, how do you actually get there? And I like your, I like your point about the message. What's the message around it? It's not just pent up demand, it's the fact that our assets go another year in service. They just do. So how do we go about not necessarily building another public safety complex, but you know, keeping up with the one we've got? Or I use that example because that seems to be, it's a building I hate personally, but nonetheless, <laughs> um, you know, there's other assets yep. that we have, to, we have to keep up with. The library trustees are going to be coming forward with a, with a, a flooring proposal. You can bet that's going to be, you know, six digits quick. And yet there's probably been 2 million people through that building since it's been built or more. Right. Well, it needs a floor. Mm -hmm. right. so, so again, I'm just, I'm just hoping we, we really move forward with something here. Yep. And keep, you know, keep the active conversation going because you know, otherwise stuff gets sort of put aside because we're dealing with just, okay, how do we make the operating budget work? And, you know, yeah. how do we, you know, you, you get caught up with the week to week stuff. Right. And then something like this, yeah. And, and so part of it, what I, you know, when I think of the process, part of it is just saying, out, okay, if we want to do this in this time frame, then we need to take the following steps to get there. Yep. Yep. Okay. And I don't know whether that time frame is, you know, during this calendar year or whether that's, already you know we can't manage that or not but if there's a, if there's any wish to do it the one thing about doing it before too long is it coincides with the drop off of the two buildings from the tax rate right exactly you, you yep. do it pretty darn quickly yep okay but doing it pretty darn quickly means okay you know again really thinking through the whole process of what's going to have to be done in order to make it happen okay. all right great point <clears throat> okay Anyway, um, the only the two other very minor things are not minor, but I mean, they're one of them was as far as the school, um, we are hoping to go to from our current two day hybrid to a four day hybrid um, starting in early March. Um, 
obviously there was some concern just with all the numbers being reported from, you know, mainly from UMass with the COVID thing, but the numbers right. seem to be trending way better in the last few days. I'm looking at the countywide numbers. Uh, you know, today's countywide number that came out was four cases countywide. Um, so, you know, I think that, and, and the other thing is that even we've had two cases in the school over the whole course of this thing, and there's been no transmission uh, spread in either one of those cases. So that uh, they've got really good procedures at the school and you hope that there's nothing gonna show up, but at least cases where it has, it has not gone any further. So, nice. um, you know, the, good. the plan is we have a, a special school committee meeting next week to vote on going forward with the four day plan. In the meantime, Darius was gonna be talking uh, with the teaching staff to make sure that any concerns they might have would be in, uh, addressed and so on, but uh, that's that. And then the only other thing I wanted to say is that you asked about COVID expenses. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing you've already got this on the list or something, but I was reading the list, uh, I think, you know, back some months ago when the first CARES thing came out about what was eligible and almost the last thing on the list was money that a town would spend for rent support for needy uh, residents of the town either rent support or mortgage support. And we had a CPA money we passed for that. And then I think we turned it over to the county, you know, to, to run the project. But that money is supposedly reimbursable by CARES. And I don't know if we're pursuing that or not. Jeff, you want to look into that? Yeah. Hmm. I, I don't know. Is that is that news to you guys? It's It's a thousand page bill peter it's something yeah. i hadn't looked at <laughs> no i just looked at yeah i just looked at when the cares thing came out last spring i oh. looked at what kinds of things were reimbursable because i was thinking about what can we what might be what might we be doing at the school that we might right. not realize would be reimbursable so one of the main things that we've gotten uh you know a bunch of stuff is with technology you know both hardware and software because they've had to you know they bought a whole lot of new software for doing remote teaching Yep. Okay. And that's kind of stuff that, you know, so I was looking down the whole list that the, you know, was on the mass.gov and, you know, the whole list was only going, you know, it didn't, it wasn't that long. Mm -hmm. And the very last item was for rent support hmm. for, for needy citizens. Huh. Can you know. certainly take a look at it. Yeah. So if, we, if, we, if, we, if we, if we, we appropriated 50,000 out of CPA money for that, I don't know how much has been spent. Or will be spent, but that would be some you know that ought to be looked at. Yep. Yeah. So CARES funds aren't reimbursable, Peter. They, they actually give it to you up front, and so we right. did not include that. Um, and but I do know that other communities. I think that Amherst has a rental assistance program that the town runs, and I think that's funded through CARES money. It's already so it's too certain, late. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's already, too late. it's already too late to get anything for for the fifty thousand that we we allocated. Uh, Meaning reimburse the town for the allocation, Peter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't think that we could do that. Okay. If we wanted to talk about setting up something else, we could try and figure that out. But um, I think that that and that, my understanding was that was something that the CPA committee wanted to do themselves, and it it was their suggestion. Okay. Um, and yeah. Although I'm sure if they if if we could get them a check for 50 grand to put back yeah. in their <laughs> pocket, they would be okay with that. But, Just so I'd mention in case you guys weren't aware of it, yeah, that's all. Yeah. That you. is one of the three pillars though, is, you know, it's what historic preservation, uh, open space, and then housing, so. Okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, thank you very much. And I just, I hope the capital discussion continues. Oh yeah, we just basically kicked it off tonight, to, you know, like a, the, the reveal, I guess, or whatever you want to call it, so. Okay. Yeah, thank Excellent. you, though. Yep. All right, thanks. All right. So if there's no other public comments, our next meeting will be next Monday at our usual time, 6.30 p.m. <clears throat> um, and if there's nothing else, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion. All right. Second. Second. All right. All those in favor of adjournment at uh, 8.08 p.m. Aye. Aye. All right. Thanks, everybody. And thanks for coming. And we'll see you next week.